word of God, Lord, with the gift and be able to be helped in this matter. I pray that you'd help, Lord, those that are here. Thank you, Lord, for the visitors we have in Jesus' name. And amen. If you're visiting, remain standing. If you're not a member of the church, remain standing. We have a couple of preachers I see here, and I appreciate you being. If you're not a member, right here, introduce yourself. Go ahead, brother, introduce them. There you go. Uh, Robert Davis, Rock Ministries. Absolutely. Good to see you, my brother, again. God bless you. Yes, sir, right here. Spencer? Good. God bless you, Brother Smith. I'm glad that you're here. And uh, went to Kenya with him. Long time. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you being here. Yes, sir. Wonderful. God bless you. I'm glad you're here, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Tommy. I'm glad that you're here, son. Yes, sir. Well, Graham, thank you for being here. God bless you. All right. Yes, sir. Back here. Yes, sir. Yes, Tom. Thank you for being here again. God bless you. Yes, sir. Back. Bless you. Good to see you again, old buddy. All right. Anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Okay. Hey, we said two songs and you're up. You're up. I, unless you want me to sing a special, I ain't doing that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, good to be saved. Good to be in church. Good to see me. You guys slow right down on that third point, you know. Uh, well, we do have a little crisis. I think my markers have disappeared. But um, uh, we'll get into this. It's okay. Um, uh, we, got, we got comments. Comments from last night's message. A zombie uh, from Phoenix got on the internet. I don't check this stuff out. I told you I don't care about what it is. But somebody contacted me and said, uh, here's what they said. Gomez needs to lose weight. Wait a second. You know what I think? How much did you lose, brother? Yeah, but you know, the guy lost weight. He looks good, doesn't he? I mean, you know. It was like me. I lost weight. I said, that wasn't, I didn't make, it didn't make me look good. It's just less ugly to, to look at. Uh, Gip should retire. But I just did. Uh, my truck's got good tread. Um, what he meant to say was, look at the amazing energy he still has. <laughs> Isn't it funny? You know, people talk about uh, preachers retiring. I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, but uh, they talk about the people retiring. And, but, you know, when people shoot at you like that, if all they can do is talk about you, that means they can't talk about what you said. Uh, the guy said, Gip didn't use much scripture. I counted 32 verses. And considering he didn't even, didn't even refute one of them, that's why he had to say, I need to retire. Uh, well, he needs to get in. Well, there, he needs to, uh, he just needs to get in, in business. All right. All right. Uh, there's a simple rule, simple rule. You know, you know, um, you have to be careful. We, uh, we all are good at making up rules that say what, you know, what we want. I was telling college today, uh, I stand back at the book table one time in a church and, uh, a uh, little Christian school was filing past, and this little girl, oh, six years old, you know, seven years old, whatever, she just, as she walked past my book table, she just reached over and snatched up a music CD and kept on going. I said, uh, well, well, hon, I said, uh, what are you doing? She goes, well, they're free for kids, aren't they? Oh, boy, we're in trouble, aren't we? Yeah. Anyway, uh, she said, they're free for kids, aren't they? Now, where did she get that? So I broke her little arm. Anyway, no, I didn't. But you just make up rules, correct? But there are some rules that, that were around before you and I were born. Uh, there's one that we won't discuss tonight. We probably mentioned it on Wednesday, but it's one you heard before called the Law of First Mention. Okay? Uh, law of First Mention. Um, I tell folks, I said, first mention of a snake was uh, Genesis chapter 3, and they've been bad ever since. Okay? I mean, I know a guy likes snakes. I said, pal, if it ain't a belt or a hat band, it ain't a good snake. <laughs> and, uh, and there's another, uh, another uh, you know, kind of like a framework by which to uh, uh, study your Bible. And it's, and it's ask, when you, read a, when you read a passage, ask three simple questions. And the first question you ask is, can you guys see this? Should have bought the good tickets, bucko. I 
I can handle it. If it ain't electric, I can handle it. All right. Uh, first question is, who's talking? All right. You say that's pretty simple. It is simple. But when you're reading, when you want to, when you want to interpret a passage of scripture, uh, you look at it and you ask, who's talking? Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24. I was enjoying, I was enjoying your pastor last night uh, on his second sermon when I was done. <laughs> because he was coming down through tonight's outline. And that is not a problem at all. I was in this meeting one time and I preached out of Genesis 22. And, uh, and then the guy came up to preach behind me and he goes, he goes, Brother Gip, he said, I've been preaching 25 years. This never happened before, but he said, God is having me preach out of Genesis chapter 22. And he said, I'm just going to preach what, and he preached a message out of the same text. Now, some preachers get upset about that. I start laughing. And you know why? Don't you figure somebody in there needed it? And when I got done, he probably went, I made it through. I said, John Calvin lives, brother. I mean, that guy got another barrel. But um, your pastor, he, your pastor nailed a lot of this stuff down, but we're going to look at it a little more in depth and correctly. Um, uh, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. And I love these people that, and especially, you know, I tell college students, preachers, preachers, please. Um, I tell them, I hope the last thing, last time you learned something from the Bible wasn't right before you graduated from, from Bible college, like you haven't opened your Bible, haven't studied anything since. Uh, we should be students of the book. We really should. We should always be students of the book. And you should be studying this book until one of two things happens. You die or you hear a real loud trumpet. And I'm afraid some guys, uh, let me tell you, when I was, uh, and, and I'm sure your pastor remember this, some of you remember this, in my day when I was a kid, doctors made house calls. Remember when doctors made house calls? I mean, these, these guys, they could do open heart surgery on a kitchen table, okay? And, and you always knew if it was a doctor because he carried a little black leather bag, right? I mean, you would see a strange car pull into the driveway across the street. A strange man would get out of the house. You'd go, well, who's that? Getting in there? And then he'd reach in the car. And when he came out with that black leather bag, I'd identified him as a doctor. Go, oh, the doctor's coming by, right? Right? But let me ask you a question. Couldn't somebody snatch that black? leather bag out of that car and then if they carried it people think that they were a doctor you say well how do you know he wasn't when it came time to see what he knew what he could do with what was inside of it I'm a preacher if you're a preacher you know how they know we carry a black leather book preacher car pulls in car pulls in the driveway house across the street somebody says well I wonder who that is guy gets out Reaches in, pulls out a black leather book. So that's a preacher. But you know anybody can carry one of these. You know what the difference is? Some guys don't know what to do with what's inside of it. Once you open it up, they don't know what to do with, do with anything, anything with it. So we're going to look at this. And guys, I have these guys, you know, they, they make these dogmatic statements. I call them chest beaters. Chest beaters. Oh, I'll tell you what I believe. And they, they say the, the, the more unsure of themselves they are, the louder they beat. And um, I've had guys say, I don't believe in any dispensations. And I said, well, do you believe in Old New Testament? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, we've narrowed it down to two. Okay. Guys, if they're, if they're, why is there a New Testament and an Old Testament? They are different. Okay, they are different. And God dealt with those Jews back then. He's dealing differently now. And, and if you don't recognize something about your Bible dispensationally, I'll tell you, and I've said this for years. In fact, I predicted uh, back around 1998, 1999, I predicted the problem with the mid-tribulation rapture being taught right now. Because you remember, remember everybody and their brother was dating the rapture? Everybody had to date the rapture. I was talking to a guy the other day. He said, you know, I never thought we'd be here in 2017. I said, I did. I really did. I, I knew we'd be here in 2017. Now, I, I thought we'd be 17 years in the millennium, but I, I knew we'd be here, okay? I mean, I thought somewhere around 93, rapture's going to happen. We come back in 2000. I did think we'd be here, and if you think about it, you did too. We just thought that the rapture would be behind us, and I've never been in Obama. But, um, but the fact is, guys, that you have, you have got to be a student of this book. And I said, 
with all this dating of the rapture, they've got to have the Lord, they've got to have the millennium start in 2000. And if the Lord doesn't come before 2000, you watch a bunch of these guys, uh, you know, like we're Americans, every time the price of gas goes up, we think that we're going through the tribulation. And I said, you watch and see, a bunch of guys are going to start teaching that we're going through the tribulation because they lost their faith because they kept trying to date the rapture. Guys, dating the rapture is the dumbest thing you can do. If you're wrong, you look like a fool. If you're right, who cares? I call that the greatest book that will never be written. Could you imagine dating the rapture? In fact, if you can date the rapture, think about this, it's done, done, done many times. If you can date the rapture and you say the Lord is going to come on this day, and that day comes and goes, and the Lord doesn't return. You know what that proves? You can find something in the Bible even God can't find. Now, that's some pretty good stuff there. And, um, I, I, you know, I've, I've, I'm sure there have probably been times when somebody was dating a rapture and said, now look, the Lord's got to come by this that time right here. And the Lord's probably up there going, whoa, I wrote, I wrote that book and I never saw that in there. Sat, sat on my horse, i got to get down there. And if anything will mess you up, it is Matthew chapter 24, if you don't look at it and find out, uh, and find out, uh, what, well, ask the three questions. Number one, who is talking? All right, uh, Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples. Hey, can I give you a, a little sidebar? Was the temple the house of God? That's not a trick question, come on. That's the house of God, right? You know, I don't mind if people call this building the house of God, but you know that, and, and your pastor knows. You know, we know that when we leave here tonight, when I'm done at 1230, that we're not locking God up in this building. This is not the house of God, correct? We can call, I don't mind if you call it the house of God, as long as you don't believe it. But, um, but the temple was the house of God, correct? Matthew chapter 23, he is really railing on the Pharisees. He calls them scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He calls them, you blind leaders of the blind. He calls them in verse 33, I think it is, you snakes, you bunch of vipers, generation of vipers. And I always ask people, I give them, I give them a multi-choice uh, multi, uh, question. I said, what is the worst thing the Lord said to the Pharisees in Matthew 23? Uh, he says, that over, look, look at verse 13. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 14, scribes and Pharisees, Pharisees, hypocrites. 15, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Was that the worst thing? Answer A. Answer B. 17, you fools and blind. 19, you fools and blind. That's answer B. Was it the worst thing he said, your, your scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, or was it when he said, uh, you fools and blind, or verse 33, you serpents, your generation of vipers? And the answer is D, none of the above. None of those things are the worst thing the Lord said. You know the worst thing he said? Look at verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I gather thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In John chapter 2, the Lord walked into the temple, kicked over those money changers' tables. You know what he said? He said, this is my father's house, and you made it a den of thieves. Two chapters before this, in chapter 21 of Matthew, he went back in there a second time. Now, late in his ministry, he, he kicked those tables over again, but he didn't say, this is my father's house. No, he said, Matthew 21, this is my house, and you made it a den of thieves. Look what he said, verse 38. Behold, your house. He said, you want the stinking place, you can have it. Look at chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Man, the worst thing he said to him was, you want this place, I'm out of here. I am out of here. That's free. Anyway, verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, <clears throat> See uh, see you not all these things, verily I say unto you, uh, there shall not be uh, left here one stone upon another that shall not be torn down. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, uh, what, shall be, uh, what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered them, I uh, answered and said, all right, this is not a deep question. Not, I'm not framing you. I'm not setting you up. Who's talking? Okay, we narrowed that one down. Jesus is doing the talking. The next question, who is he talking to? Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is because this isn't, this isn't a rule 
made up by Bible believers. This isn't something that we... You ever hear anybody say, uh, well, you know, pre, uh, people, uh, Easter's mistranslation, because in, in Bible times, uh, the entire eight days was called the Passover. That's a rule somebody made up. Because if that's true, wouldn't there be a verse in the Bible that said that? There's no verse in the Bible that says that. Nowhere. All right? But that's one somebody made up to try to carry the game against the King James Bible. But these are not rules we made up. So who's talking? Jesus is talking. Who's he talking to? Isn't he talking to Jews? Well, that, we narrowed that one down. I know what you're thinking. Man, three points, we're already, we're already done with point two. Well, hold your breath. In fact, hold your breath. <clears throat> All right? Look what he says. He, he, now, this is an amazing thing. Uh, I, I say this is, these are the people that when he looked them right in the face and said, hey, that, you know, sometimes I refer to the Lord's ministry, and I, I don't mean this facetiously, and I don't mean this too, I, I don't mean this too, uh, uh, you know, to be too unkind, because I've got to spend, spend eternity with 11 of these guys. But um, uh, sometimes I think of the ministry of the Lord as Jesus and the 12 stooges. I don't, I don't say that, I don't mean that, you know, disrespectfully. But like he would go, uh, he'd go, hey guys, beware of 11 of the Pharisees. And they went, ah, we know why you said that. Because we didn't bring any bread. No, I'm talking about their doctrine. Yeah, yeah I thought that too. thought that one. He sees them talking. What are you guys talking about? Nothing. What are you guys talking about? Uh, nothing. What are you guys talking about? <clears throat> well, we're just wondering if you die, you know, which one of us gets to be the, the number one guy. Wouldn't you, what could you imagine if you walked down the hall, everybody, the guys will tell you, what are you talking about? Nothing. You know you're in trouble when somebody shakes your hand and goes back there and checks your pulse. <laughs> and he looked him right in the eye and said, they're going to kill me, but don't worry, three days, three nights later, I'm rising again. How many of those guys were sitting outside the, outside the tomb on three days and three nights later waiting for him? Nobody got it. But they do know this. This thing's got to start. He's got to present himself. He's got to have a coming, uh, a reveal. So they ask him, when are you going to get this thing started? In verse uh, 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Uh, look at uh, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall uh, and show, uh, great signs and wonders insomuch that if they, it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Guys, one of the things, and this, look, this is what Stephen Anderson says. He says, you guys who don't, who, who don't think you're going halfway through the tribulation, you think you're getting out early, a pre-trib rapture, he said, you're going to be fooled when the Antichrist shows up because you're going to think he's Christ. Now, to believe that, if, if you're not, you know, sometimes what I think is if he's not on drugs, he needs to get on drugs. It wouldn't make him say anything any more intelligent or any more stupid, but at least we'd understand why he does it. Uh, guys, guys, let me ask you something. Do you believe that, that one day you're going to wake up and CNN is going to have an announcement, Jesus just showed up in Kansas? Where, are you going to, where is he going to come? He's going to come in the clouds, right? And you don't even have to be looking because you're going. You don't even have to. I mean, you're just going. I'm going to tell you who's going, to be, who's going to be fooled. It's going to be the people who are still looking for Christ. Now, Jesus was their Messiah. He was the Jews' Messiah. He was their Christ. And they, they, they uh, rejected him. But there's, the Orthodox ones are still looking for him. So they're the ones that could be fooled. And if you sit there and listen to this guy and go, yeah, because I'm preacher of rapture, I might be fooled. You just were. If you listen to him, you just were. So uh, they're looking for the Messiah to show up. And, and I, was telling, I was telling this morning in Bible college, uh, he did show up. Uh, when I was in Bible college back in the 70s, early 70s, <clears throat> there was some kind of announcement. Some guy uh, in England claimed to be Christ returned. Now, Think about this, guys. If you pick up tomorrow's headlines and it says Christ has returned, would you say, wow, he's back? Right? Would you? No. 
because you know that's not how he's coming back for us. So we're not going to be fooled by anything because we're not going to be here to be fooled, okay? Um, and this guy says uh, the, the Christ is back and he's in England and he's going to reveal himself. And, his, and, the, and I don't know why, but he said the guy's name is Benjamin Cream. I don't know if you remember that from the 70s. Uh, C-R-E-M-E. I don't even know whatever happened to Benjamin Cream. We saw, the, we saw the, 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 uh, the, the PR man that said he's coming, but I don't even know what happened. I, I don't know what happened to him. Um, maybe, maybe he got a ticket or something and got put in jail, but uh, he never got out. He never showed up. Uh, look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You're going to tell me Matthew chapter 24 is for us, and you're going to quote that verse? You know, messages, I could write a book, messages that will never be preached from this pulpit. That would be one of them. You shall endure unto the end. I told you guys back in, yesterday, we looked at it, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is this very, it's, it's just the very same thing. He sends a dozen guys out, tells them, tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, and he said, those that endure to the end are going to be saved. Israel rejected their Messiah in chapter 11. In verse 12, he says, I'll go to the Gentiles. In verse 13, the kingdom goes into a, uh, a mystery form, so much so that in John chapter 6, when he fed the 5,000, they said, hey, I'm full. Let's make this guy king. And he said, I got to get out of here or they're going to make me king. I thought he wanted to be king. But they, he made the offer and they ignored it, and it's too late. Lady, it's like when he says, will you marry me, and you say no, and then you call the next day saying, hey, I rethought about it. He said, so did I. Click. <laughs> <laughs> you had your chance yesterday. Right. And so they dropped the ball, guys, and, and now it's over. So he offered himself as their Messiah. They rejected him, and he came back. Um, so now it's going to happen. The second time it's going to happen, it's going to happen with 144,000. And the reason... Uh, is real simple. In, uh, in Bible days, there's Jerusalem, and, and you, got, uh, you got Israel's right about here, and I, I checked the figures, it is 263 miles by 71. All right? That's not a lot of real estate. Uh, probably somebody has, has equated it to one of our states, but it ain't Texas. All right? So if you needed to find Jews, this is where you found them. You found them in that little stretch of property. That's where you would find most of the Jews. So he sends a dozen guys here. There were about 200 million people, as far as I can tell, there were about 200 million people on the planet at that time, and the Jews were concentrated here. Now, as I mentioned again last night, there's more Jews in New York City. So now there's 8 billion people. He's got to send them, he's got to send 144,000 people and they're preaching the same gospel. Now guys, this is the gospel of the kingdom. No preacher in this room has ever said I preach the gospel of the kingdom. You might change tonight and rephrase it semantically so you can try to pretend you're going to prove me wrong. But the fact is that nobody says I preach the gospel of the kingdom. You preach the gospel of the grace of God. And that's a good one. That is a good one. That's got me saved. That's going to get me to heaven. That's going to get you to heaven. All right? Uh, I like this. Well, look at verse, look at verse uh, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. <clears throat> and then shall the end come. Um, this is not our commission. You know, I've heard, I've heard guys, and it sounds good, guys. It sounds good. But a lot of things that sound good aren't accurate. Uh, if you ever, you ever, do you ever go soul winning and tell somebody, you know, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, God's knocking at your door right now. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man open unto me, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Have you, ever, I've done, have you ever done that? You're trying to win somebody Christ and you use that verse? That is a good verse to use. But you know what you need to remember? That's not what that verse is talking about. That verse is talking about, that is, not, that is not the Lord trying to get into the heart of some lost guy and save him. That is the Lord in this church age, this, this Laodicean age right here where I told you we're all about people's rights. And it's knocking at your heart door, people. But you've got your earphones on and you're playing your computer game and you're watching reality TV and he's trying to have some fellowship with you. All right? 
So this isn't our commission. Our commission is Matthew chapter 28, 19. I can go to all the world. I don't need that verse. Well, the Bible says we're going to preach the gospel in every nation before the Lord comes back. Not if you're using that verse. You know, one of the things I told you, I think I was telling, well, I was telling guys this morning, uh, the great truth of preaching, the great truth of preaching, if a guy gets this down, he can be a great preacher. In lieu of conviction, intimidation will work. When we preach, what we're hoping is we're hoping that we say something so right that the Holy Spirit says amen to you. And when the Holy Spirit says amen, you go, uh-oh, i got to get right with God. Correct? Okay. Well, if the Holy Spirit isn't going to get in the room, then I will guilt trip you, and I'll make you think that you're under conviction. And so, uh, guys, I, I picked up a book on missions. The first sentence, we have failed at the Great Commission. I'm here to tell you we haven't. Man, I've read some books. We have, we have been around the world of the gospel. But you see, we, we, we're so used to slinging guilt, we can't actually imagine somebody would do it just because they're supposed to do it. So i got to make you feel guilty about all the people going to hell. I feel bad about the people going to hell, guys. My wife and I support 20 missionaries on our own. That's, uh, let's see, $20 a month. One, two, three. But we do. We support 20 missionaries. Say, why? Because we have a burden for missions. Okay. And I've got enough out of Matthew to take, to take the gospel around the world. I don't need this one. But this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached around the world uh, during that tribulation because the Lord is coming. Those Jews are all around the world. Now there's something really cool in verse 15. Look at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Where's the holy place? It's in a temple. Well, that temple's not here. You say, well, what if they build it? It wouldn't be holy to you anyway. Look, uh, uh, you know, they got a Mormon temple there in Boise, uh, Idaho. Doesn't mean a thing to me. Uh, you probably got a big Roman Catholic cathedral somewhere around here. Ain't holy to me. Not holy to you. And if the Jews got to rebuild their temple, I'll tell you what I'd be excited. I would be excited that we know we're edging even closer to our, dis our, uh, uh, our disappearance, Right? But I, and I might respect it if they said, hey, that's our holy place. You can't go in there. Then I wouldn't go in there. But I wouldn't think it was holy. You know why? Because if they built the temple today, it still would not be the house of God. I am the house of God. I told you to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. I don't know if any of you did it last night. But I told you, here's this bunch of dogs, these barbarians, these foreigners, these strangers, these aliens who weren't allowed into the temple, let alone the holy of holies. And it, you know where it ends? We couldn't get in the house of God. And verse 22 says, I am a habitation of God. If they built the temple today, I am holier than that building. Right? And if you're saved, so are you. Now, but here's, here's if I can use this word, man, this is not a word I use a lot. Precious. Precious. <laughs> Look at verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, parenthesis, whoso readeth, let him understand, parenthesis. That is a precious parenthesis. You know, one of the things that I teach, and I show people that, that um, the Bible is written to us. And you know what a parenthesis is when somebody writes to you? Somebody is writing something to you, and then they insert a, a personal note, a personal note, a, an explanatory note. And I think it's precious that God not only just wrote us this book, but every now and then he put a little explanatory note. You know, it's a parenthesis in uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, or 3, that explains Easter being a proper translation. It's a parenthesis in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. It is a parenthesis that, that reveals how the biblical way to handle archaic words in your Bible. And I, I, I think it's, don't you think it, now, don't you think it's great that God wrote the Bible to you? And if that wasn't enough, not only did he write the Bible to you, but every now and then, he just went, oh, and by the way, Gip, and wrote a personal note, just an explanatory note that, that explains something. You know what that one explains? All right, if we leave, and then the temple is here, and the Antichrist steps inside of it, and we're gone, that note is not to you and me. Right? And who's he talking to? You know what that parenthesis tells you? That parenthesis is prophetical 
That is letting you know that in the tribulation, the Jews will be reading the New Testament. Now, I'm not saying all of them, but I'm telling you some Jew is going to find himself a Gideon Bible out of a motel. He's going to sneak out behind a barn. He's going to say, something's going on here. I want to find out. And he's going to go that. And he's going to say, whosoever readeth, let him understand. And it is going to turn the lights on for that guy. Isn't that neat that God would put a little pro a pr a prophetic parenthesis to some Jew that is on this planet, possibly right now, just to let him know, he that readeth, let him understand. So there's going to be a holy place here. Uh, look at verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the, into the mountains. In case you didn't know, uh, some of you guys are just recent high school graduates. Judea is not one of the United States. I know, I know we have 57 of them. Because uh, a Kenyan history teacher said that once. But it's talking about Judea. That is, that is this area, which is why I say maybe there's going to be a worldwide persecution of the Jews, but when this thing comes down, it's going to come down on the heads of the Jews that are in Israel. All right. Um, look at verse, uh, well, let's just read verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop uh, not come down to take his, uh, anything out of the house, uh, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Oh, that's right. You guys keep the Sabbath day, don't you? What's, what's the Sabbath? What day is it? When do you have your services? Now, there's some seven-day Baptists. There's some folks that think they ought to meet on Saturday. You say, well, how do you know we shouldn't? Well, I'll tell you how you know. Uh, well, read your Bible. And in Acts chapter 15, those Judaizers, they came up from Jerusalem, they went up to Antioch, and they said, you guys are going to be circumcised, keep the law of Moses, or you're not saved. Remember that? And Paul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem. They said, what are you guys doing sending these people up here? We didn't send them up there. Well, we've got to go back here. What's going to go on? They said, well, look, tell them they're on their own, and here's what we advise. Tell them to abstain from fornication, from blood, from things strangled, and one more. My mind just went blank. And from pizza. <laughs> Acts chapter, you don't have to turn. Here it is. Abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Why isn't there a fifth one that says, and tell them to keep the Sabbath? If we were supposed to keep the Sabbath, somebody would have told us right there. So if you're wondering why we don't meet on Sabbath, that's one of the reasons we meet on Sunday. These people, whoever they're talking to, meet on the Sabbath, and that's because they're Jews. Now, <clears throat> look at verse um, 22. Uh, and except those, oh wait, let's read 21 just in case somebody thinks I'm skipping over because the word great tribulation is in there. Uh, For then shall be the great tribulation such as was not, uh, was not since the beginning of the world uh, to, uh, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, uh, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those things shall be short. Now, guys, one of the things that I, 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 I try to stress on my Gentile brethren is don't be so greedy. By that, I mean, we, we like to think that it is all about us. And I got news for you. It's all about the Jews. It is not all about you. We're reading a Jewish book. They're not reading a Gentile book. We're worshiping a Jew. They're not worshiping a Gentile. Isn't that right? And so here's what you see. Now, let me explain. Elect has nothing to do with being lost and elect to get saved. And if you think it does, you've been reading John Calvin. You've not been reading King James. And the short side of this is, the, 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 the quick definition is, that election is not unto salvation. I'll explain it in just a second. Now, here we're coming back to that one rule, the law of first mention. So let's find out the first time elect is mentioned. Uh, keep your place here, but go, go back to um, Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. Verse 1, Behold my servant whom I pulled, mine elect, there it is, <clears throat> in whom my soul delighteth, I put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench, and he shall bring forth judgment unto truth. 
Who is that talking about? Guys, you don't have to worry when I ask you a question. The answer is obvious. I am not trying to hook you now. I'm asking you again, who is that talking about? That is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So, the elect. Jesus is the elect. You say, well, he didn't have to get saved. That's because election is not unto salvation. You know what it's unto? Reigning. Because you've got to have a def definition of election that, that covers everybody that, uh, that carries the title. Okay? So here's what you do. Every time you see the word election or the elect, you put the, the first definition of the elect. Put Jesus in the verse. Let's read the verse this way. Uh, Matt, keep your place in uh, Isaiah. Look at verse 22. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for Jesus' sake those days shall be shortened. Now that doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Look at verse 24. Uh, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, uh, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch uh, that if it were possible, they, should, they shall deceive the very elect. Is anybody going to de de deceive Jesus? then that can't be the elect. He can't be the elect that verse is talking about. You know what we need to do? We need to see if there's another, anybody else called the elect. And it just so happens, if you're in Isaiah chapter 42, go three chapters over to chapter 45. Chapter 45, verse 4 says this, For Jacob my servant's sake, for Israel mine elect. So if the first definition of election doesn't fit, then try the second one. And the second is Israel's. Now, guys, we are also called God's elect. If election is unto salvation, first off, Jesus doesn't have to trust Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, right? And if election is unto salvation, Israel's called God's elect, which means every Jew on the planet is going to get saved because Israel's the elect. If, if election is unto salvation, they're all going to get saved. I know guys that believe that. And if you believe that, don't read your Bible. Because the Bible will mess up what you believe. Because in uh, Numbers chapter 16, remember the first deacons meeting? Cord, Dath, and Byron show up and said, Moses, Moses, you take too much upon you. And the Bible says the earth opened up and they went down live into the pit. They went to hell in, in uh, Numbers chapter 16 and they were Jews. Or, if you don't like that one, go to Luke chapter 16. You don't have to turn there, but Luke chapter 16. And that's where the Bible says uh, Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Why did that rich man see Abraham and say, Father Abraham? Because he's a Jew and he's been, in, he's been in hell for over 2,000 years. So, election can't be unto salvation. But, isn't there a day when Jesus is going to come down here and reign? And aren't the Jews going to get this earth? And don't you have an opportunity to reign? So, election, you knew that. Last November, we voted in uh, Donald Trump. He got voted in November, but he didn't take office until January. Between November and January, what do we call him? President-elect. Why? Been voted in, hadn't taken office. Do you know why those three are called the elect? Because Jesus has been, well, he's not been voted in, but he's going to reign, but he hasn't, he hasn't come down here and done it yet. The Jews are going to reign. They haven't done it yet. You got voted in by a one-vote landslide. Jesus voted you in. But between that election and, and taken office at inauguration, if they found out that he had done something wrong, and I'm telling you, if he had done something wrong, the liberals would have found out by now. He'd never, he'd never, he'd never reign. That's why you have to make your calling an election what? Sure. Because you cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose your election. Okay? So, even the elect could be fooled. Uh, go back to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, uh, we saw that uh, where they're going to say, here is Christ and, and, and there is Christ. Look at verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. Uh, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert. Uh, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. 
believe it not. Now it says, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, uh, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For where, so, uh, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And immediately after the tribu tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, uh, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall the sign of the Son of Man uh, in heaven, uh, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, uh, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. I was mentioned to him in college today, we are not in tribes, but it's coming. Now, we used to be in tribes. You know, I say we, uh, you know, we talk about people in Africa living in tribes and the Indians lived in tribes and all these other third world countries lived in tribes. Hey, whitey, go back far enough in your kin. I mean, go back to Europe and I'll tell you what your kinfolk used to do. They used to rub bear grease on themselves, plant their field and go bash each other's brains out because they weren't were in the same tribe. And you guys that watch Survivor and don't think, don't they have tribes? People are being conditioned now to think tribal. Uh, I'll, I'll explain something. You've read this in the papers. Uh, look, you know, who's, you know who's killing black folks in Africa? Yeah, black folks. Say why? Wrong tribe. Yeah, wrong tribe. You know who's killing white folks in Bosnia? White folks. Say, what is it? Wrong tribe. And when you read this gang warfare, just take, like anytime you read an article, a news article about this gang was killing this gang, just do this one time. Take the word gang out and, and read tribe. And suddenly it makes, you got, you got, here's this Mexican gang and a Mexican gang. Why is, I thought, I thought I was supposed to, guys supposed to kill. They're killing each other. Well, I thought they're the same guys. Nope. Wrong tribe. What are bikers? You're not in my tribe. And so guys, it's going to get back to tribes. One of the things I point out is that brother, when that gospel, when that gospel, when Paul stepped into Macedonia and came up into Europe, those European tribes took a look at that and they said, hey. It's pretty good stuff. And tribalism in Europe died and nationalism rose. And really that book altered the history and the format, the national format of this world. That is an amazing book. But they'll be back to tribes. Uh, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds uh, of heaven with power and, and great glory. Uh, and he shall send his angels with a uh, great sound of a trumpet uh, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. That's Israel. Can't be Jesus. So it is Israel. All right. There's nothing in, in 1 Thessalonians says he's sending angels to gather us up. It says we're going to hear our trumpet and we're going to meet him in the clouds. You know why we meet in the clouds, don't you? Give Baptists time to get there. I'll guarantee you. Because Baptists are late for everything. I'll guarantee you, man, that the rapture is going to happen. And, and there's going to be some Church of God guy or some, some saved holiness guy up there going, see, there are no Baptists up here. I told you they weren't saved. And the Lord will go, I'll give them about five more minutes. They're back in their cars in the clouds right now. So, so this is a, there is a mid-tribulation rapture, guys. It's just not us, okay? Here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Because he's talking to the Jews. And he's, uh, it's Jesus doing the talking. And he's talking to the Jews. And what he's talking about is his coming. All right? You got a seven-year period. And it is seven years. Some guys think it's three and they're only half right. It's seven years. So this is three and a half, and this is three and a half. And all of this can rightfully be called the tribulation, or you can call it the great tribulation. But here's the divider. Now, now we're going to go up here before this thing starts. You know, one of the things, I, th I think I mentioned the other day, one of the things I can't understand about these guys that are going halfway through tribulation, no, none of them can tell us how it's going to start. And I, you watch it. Most people that think we're going through it think we're about 10 years into the first three and a half years. 
Really, really. And so um, here's what's going to happen. Uh, you have got two guys that show up here called Moses and Elijah. Now, here's the thing about these two guys. You know, they show up in, uh, look at, keep your place. Always keep your place here in, in um, uh, Matthew chapter 24. But go back to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. And Revelation chapter 11. Uh, begin, read verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, an angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Temple's there. They're measuring the temple of God. It's going to go up. The temple of God and the altar <clears throat> and them that worship therein. Who would that be? Who would who'd be worshiping in the temple? Guys, you cannot get away from the fact that this is Jews, Jews, Jews. Now, I know what, I know what Stephen Ann's going to say. Well, that's because that's me. I am their replacement. He could do a better job than that. Okay? Um, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. Uh, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I'll give power unto my two witnesses. Uh, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Guys... Their ministry is not like a month or two, but these guys are ministering for three and a half years. That is also going to coincide with the ministry of the 144,000. So here's what's going to happen. At the beginning of this tribulation, Moses and Elijah are going to show up. They're going to stay in Jerusalem, and they're going to start giving this world a hard time. And, and basically what this is, I told you, this is basically, this seven years, is it's a free fire zone. God He's judging this world for what they have done. They've ignored his, his, uh, uh, his book. They've lived contrary to his rules. They murdered his son. They've murdered his prophets. Isn't that true? This, hey, let me tell you, you guys, some of you guys, you actually think liberals are sincere. And, and they say things like, well, we don't think that schools should teach religion. They don't believe that at all. They say that when they keep Christianity out. Let me tell you why the world backs Muslims. They don't back them because they think they're a, 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 a religion of peace. They back them because the world hates two people on this planet, Jews and Christians. And they're hoping the Muslims will kill us. That is the, that is the exact reason. Every liberal that, that says uh, Islam is a, is a uh, religion of peace, yeah, and we know which peace from here up. But the fact is they hate us and they hate the Jews. If anything riles me, it is to hear somebody like CNN accuse somebody uh, like they don't like them and they're trying to destroy them and they say it's because they're anti-Semitic. There's nobody more anti-Semitic than CNN and USA Today and Newsweek and any probably any college. All right. So this is a free fire zone. So here's what's going to happen. At the beginning of this, these guys are going to go out, 144,000. They're going to go around the world and they're going to say what the disciples said in Matthew chapter 10. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Jerusalem, these two guys are going to be really wreaking havoc. Uh, look what they get to do. Uh, verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Uh, these are the two olive trees and two candlesticks, the two candlesticks standing before the, the, the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, they must in this manner be killed. Now guys, that's what's going to be going on in the first half. Now I will say some people put this in the second half. You put it any place you want. I put it in the first half because the whole thing flows and it makes sense. Here's why. Um, verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, which means it's not going to rain three and a half, for three and a half years, right? Well, I think Elijah knows what that's about. Okay. Um, that uh, power shut uh, heaven, that it rain not the days of their prophecy, and have power over water to turn them to blood. I think Moses had a little experience at that. 
uh, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. You know, I'll bet you it wouldn't take a prophet led of God in this room. I'll bet you if you went back to Exodus, I'll bet you could guess what those, what those plagues are going to be. Um, and when they had, they had finished their ministry, okay, three and a half years, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them <clears throat> and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So we know this is going on in Jerusalem. All right, so when they get killed, uh, look what it says. And they, uh, they of the people and kindred and tongues of the nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be uh, put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. I've heard people say it's going to happen at Christmas because they're making merry and giving gifts. Um, I think it's going to happen in, in April. <coughs> And they uh, send gifts one to another because, they too, uh, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entereth into them, and they stood up upon, or they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon uh, them which saw them. And they heard a, vo a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. All right? So these guys... They prophesy for three and a half years. They get killed. Three and a half days later, they are raptured out. I'll tell you who goes. There's going to be three groups that go. It's going to be Moses and Elijah. It's going to be the 144,000. And it's going to be any of these Jews that bought what these guys are telling. Now, this rapture, this rapture is unique in, biblic, in, in the Bible in that it is the only rapture we can watch take place. In three verses of your Bible, this rapture will take place. Uh, go to, to uh, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> And look at verse 1. And this is a parallel. This is paralleled with, with Revelation chapter 11. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him in 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. You ever think about the mark of the beast? You know, everybody says that, that, that the beast is going to talk people into taking this or force them to take the, the mark in their forehead. Have you ever noticed that everything the world does is really a counterfeit of Christianity? Okay, let me ask you a question. You're saved, I'm saved. Are we brothers? The Bible says we are. So you join some mason or some, some fraternal order and they call each other brothers. Right? What are they doing? They're copying us. Let me ask you a question. When you got saved, didn't you get a new name written in glory? So when you were baptized into the Catholic Church, they gave you a name. And uh, when Cassius Clay became a Muslim, he became Muhammad Ali. It is all counterfeit. Um, I want to say Ezekiel 16, I think that's the chapter where it says that uh, God is going to bring, and it's parallel to this, where God is going to bring some trouble down on this earth. And he says, not until I take the ink horn and I mark the, the, the uh, servants of God in their forehead. Maybe that mark in the forehead of the lost world is them trying to be, uh, to, to kind of mimic what the servants of God. This, these people that that buy into this, these believers, they're, maybe they're going to get a mark right here that marks them as a believer, and the lost world says, I want one of those too. But here they stand. All right, it says, I looked, and, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Can somebody tell me where Mount Zion is? Jerusalem. It is on this earth. So you've got the lamb, you've got the 144,000, they're standing on, Jeru on, on Mount Zion in verse 1. Now look at verse 2. And I heard a voice <clears throat> from heaven. That's the same words used in, in, in chapter 11 where it said, I heard a voice from heaven come up hither. Now I was telling today, uh, you ever hear a car wreck? There are two distinct sounds to a car wreck. Eep, right? You always have the screeching brakes and then the impact. 
And I was preaching, no, I can't remember, 20 years, 25 years ago, uh, down in uh, North, uh, no, not Norfolk, Knoxville, right next to Norfolk. I'm preaching in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm standing out in the church parking lot on a nice day like today, and I heard a car wreck. But I didn't hear any screech and brakes. I just heard the impact of metal against metal, but the sound came from above me. I'm standing there, and I heard what sounded like a car wreck above my head with no screech and brakes because you can't get traction up there. And I thought, and you know that this, this fleeting thought went through my head that you can't have a car wreck in the sky. And I looked up, and when I looked up, I saw, if you guys are Air Force, two KC-135 uh, tankers. That's uh, old 707. And here was their flight path. Now, I got enough sense to figure, okay, if we go back about three seconds... Now, I don't know if you're aware of this. I just gave your pastor an Air Force magazine. I read Air Force magazine. Keeps, I, I just like to keep up to date. Uh, do, you know what the, <clears throat> do you know what the greatest um, peacetime damage uh, uh, airplane accidents that our Air Force has? The greatest single accident. The single most, the, the accident that happens uh, time and time again is damaged wings. Because they're jocks. They're cool. And you know what they do? They try to fly as close as they can. Uh, Forty some years ago, almost fifty, I was I was in a yeah about about fifty. I was in a uh, college to be a computer programmer, and one of my fellow students, uh, he was older than me. Uh, he had been a a waste gunner in a B twenty four in World War II. And if you know anything about that, I mean it's an open window, ten thousand feet, and there's no glass because you got this <clears throat> fifty caliber hanging out in the slipstream. And you've seen those World War II pictures where the where the planes are flying real close together. So that, the, so that the Messerschmitts couldn't dive through them. And I, I said, and I mean, I've seen those guys. You know, you look and they think, how close do they fly? I said, how, how close did you guys fly? He said, if I could reach out my window and touch the wingtip of the plane next to me, I knew we were close. I never saw them that close in a movie. But he said, that's how close we got so that those planes couldn't dive in and break up our formation. And what these, what these pilots will do is they want to get as close as they can. And you know what happens? They end up bumping wings. A few years ago, an F-15 and an A-4 Israeli, Israeli A-4, Israeli F-15, um, they were on, they were on a, on a, on a, on a uh, training flight, and the A-4 took the whole right wing off an F-15. I'm from the engine box out. The thing is gone, and that Jewish pilot landed it. God blesses the Jews, guys. I, I worry if I, if I see a guy with a turban on his head flying my plane, give me a Jew, okay? I know if he gets it up, we can leave a wing up there. And he'll land it. And so here's what had happened. Here's these two, I guarantee it, two KC-135s. These guys were playing games, and they got up there, and they slapped wingtips. And as soon as they slapped wingtips, you know what they did? Let's go this way. But they, I heard it from above me. So you got these guys in verse 1. They're standing on Mount Zion. They hear a voice from heaven. We know what the voice says. Come up hither. That's what it said in chapter 11 when it, they heard a voice from heaven. Now look at verse 3. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. Just in case you didn't know where that is. That's identified in Revelation chapter 4. And the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which redeemed, which were redeemed from the earth. So these guys go up in the middle of tri tribulation. Who is it? Moses and Elijah, the hundred and forty-four thousand witnesses, uh, and the uh, believers. By the way, Stephen Anderson does not believe that those hundred and forty-four thousand. He doesn't believe. You tell me. What nation nationality are they? What sex are they? And are they, are they virgins? He doesn't believe any of those three. He doesn't believe they're Jews. He doesn't believe they're males. He doesn't believe, maybe they're Caitlyn Jenner. A, uh, uh, and he doesn't believe they're virgins. Now, you know what you decide? You decide are you going to believe your Bible or are you going to believe him? You know, that's the whole problem, guys. Somebody decided they're going to believe him and then... Some of them just don't like my attitude. They don't like, well, I, you know, you think you're so smart. Well, you may not like me, but that still doesn't make the Bible any less true. 
That book is still true. Let me tell you what they're going to be. They're going to be Jewish. They're going to be men. And they're going to be virgins. Now, don't come to me and say, well, how are you going to find a hundred? I don't have to find anybody. God did this. And so he can worry about that census. All right. Now, here's what happens. Take a look. Uh, keep your place here. Uh, but go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it, and is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So what happens is, and I told you, maybe, whatever it is, whatever it is, maybe it is somebody with some Muslims, whatever it is, somehow this Antichrist is going to, get, is going to endear himself to the world. And uh, they're not going to make him a, an absolute antichrist yet. He's just a good politician up to this point. He gussies up to the Jews, makes a covenant with them. Uh, they get that temple up there, and he shows up, like it said in Matthew chapter 24. And he says, nice building. Thank you. You had a lot to do with it. Yeah, well, I'm really glad. Uh, what's back here? Oh, no, that's the Holy of Holy. We, we appreciate what you did, but you can't go in there. Well, I can go in there. Oh, no, no, see, that's just for God. That's why I'm going in there. Um. What if, what if one of you guys, uh, what if you just picked up somebody, you brought them to this church, and you said, I'm the pastor of this church. They go, oh, you're not the pastor. Yes, I am. And then you pull in the parking lot. Do you, have a, do, you have a, do you have a spot that says reserved for pastor? Yeah. So he pulls in and says, look right here. It says reserved for pastor. I'm parking here. Well, you must be the pastor. <laughs> He's going to sit in the mercy seat, in the Holy Holy, saying, and it's going to, he said, I'm proven that I'm God. How do you know? I'm parking in his spot. And when those Jews go, no, get out of here, he's going to, I'll take care of you, pal. And that's when it becomes, this last three and a half years, Jacob's trouble. And trouble it will be. And he is going to wipe those Jews out if he can. Now, <clears throat> Look at verse, uh, chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 12. And look what happens right after that rapture in chapter 11. Look what happens in chapter 12. And there appeared, uh, verse 1, appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and uh, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. What's the Gentile number? 10? How come it ain't 10 stars? What's a, what's a, what's a Jew's number? Well, then can't you even figure that out? Anybody ought to figure. If it's 12, it is not us. Uh, and and uh, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, uh, having seven heads and ten horns uh, and, the seven cr and seven crowns upon his head. Guys, you got to figure out who that is. Uh, and he drew his, uh, and his tail <clears throat> drew third part of the uh, stars of heaven. And did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was uh, ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, here's one of the most amazing things about that passage right there. Is that woman Israel? Isn't it? Stephen Anderson says, that woman's Israel. Wow, isn't that funny? God quit dealing with the Jews until he says. But you know what he's telling you? Remember I told you, you get to the last book of the Bible, God still, you, you wind it all up. And God's still dealing with local churches when he gets into this. And then in chapter 4, we get out of here. And now he's not dealing with the church anymore. He's still dealing with those Jews at the end, guys. And look, I'm going to just, look, I'm just gonna tell you something. You need to be here tomorrow night and pray for me because I'm, I have got to jam three hours of preaching into about two hours and 55 minutes. There is so much scripture tomorrow, it, it, is, uh, it is amazing. The guy that said I didn't give enough scripture today, I hope he listens. Anyway, um, um, verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up unto God and to the throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, <clears throat> that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That just took care of the second half of the tribulation, correct? So, the first half, and now, mind you, all seven years, this world is going to be getting punishment from God 
with all of the things that are going to happen. But that last seven and a half years, this, this Jacob's trouble, this, is, this isn't God blasting the Jews. This is the Antichrist saying, I'll wipe you out. And I'm not going to say this, I'm not going to say this absolutely, but what it does appear, maybe there will be a worldwide persecution against the Jews, but for sure, it's those guys in Judea, Matthew chapter 24. Um, I, I doubt any Jews in, in Chicago are going to go, let's get on the plane to go to say the Petra, huh? But the guys there are going to go, so they're going to run. <clears throat> Look what it says, verse 7. Now, now, this is some speculation. You're allowed to speculate. This book of Revelation. I love people that got Revelation figured out. I like to get four people that got Revelation figured out, put them all in the same room, leave no guns or anything sharp. Uh, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed, <clears throat> prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. What, and I've heard this taught, and this may be what it is. And like I said, guys, now you should not be open-minded about a plan of salvation. You got that one settled, don't you? You should not be open-minded about the Trinity, the Godhead. You should not be open-minded about eternal security. You should not be open-minded about the Lord coming back. Isn't that right? But there are some things that are questions. And, and I tell guys, I say, you don't have to believe this. Just, just keep it in mind that somebody said it. So that you can kind of have that in the back of your mind. Uh, like, like I told you the other day, or yesterday, maybe, maybe the way the Antichrist is going to endear himself to the world is maybe he'll just knock off all the Muslims and that will do it. I'm not telling you that's what's going to happen. Keep that in mind. And maybe you'll see that happen. I don't know. But what it looks like is that in this mid-tribulation rapture, when these guys go up, the devil goes after them. And Michael steps in between them. Now, I was telling the students today, there's only two angels in heaven whose names are given. For all of you former Roman Catholics, there is no angel Raphael. That's a heartbreaker. That comes from the Apocrypha. But two angels that are named, actually there's three beings, other than God, there are three beings who have names that, that are in heaven, uh, who we have names for. Lucifer, Gabriel, Michael. Seven, seven, seven. All seven letters. I've often speculated to wonder if every name in heaven's got seven letters. But, three guys, each guy gets a third of the, of the angels. We know what Lucifer's job was. Lucifer's job was the anointed cherub that covereth. There's the throne. And, and he was up here and, and I, I, I can't do this. I did this today. I put a bunch of colors. But this is kind of like my old TV in 1950s. It's all black and white. But, um, but anyway, his job, uh, when I asked him to, to, today at the college, you guys ever, you ever watch a spotlight that is shown on one of those disco balls and those lights go all around? You ever see that? What were you guys doing in a room with a disco ball? <laughs> You've got a problem in this church, brother. Anyway, his job, you know, what, you know what Lucifer means? Light bearer. His job was to just let the glory of God reflect off of him and manifest the light of God all over. Gabriel, his job is talking. When God wants to, wants to inform somebody of somebody, something, he sends Gabriel. When he wanted to talk to Daniel, he sent Gabriel. When he wanted to tell Mary she's going to have a baby, he sent Gabriel. So you can figure when, when it says an angel showed up, it's Gabriel. And I, I explained this, really, guys, you knew that already because when, when, when two people are talking, you go, uh, we're just gabbing. Where would you think gab came from? Think about that word. Why did gab have anything to do with eating? Or with eating? With, sorry, I was overcome by being a Baptist. Um, <laughs> Why, is, why does the word gab have anything to do with, with, uh, with speaking? Because Gabriel is the talker. So we say, boy, aren't they gabby? Michael is the George S. Patton of heaven. When God wants, hey, when there's contention, Michael shows up. God says, hey, I need the body of Moses. Uh, should we send Gabriel? We're not going to negotiate a contract. 
said, don't send Gabriel, send Michael. Michael went down there and contended. Michael shows up here. I tell all these guys, you know, some angel glowed in my bedroom. I said, if an angel ever glows in your bedroom at night, just ask him his name. You know, we live in a motorhome. There ain't room for three of us. He's got to, he's got to be outside. But um, I said, if an angel just ever, ever glows in your bedroom, say, what's your name? If he says, Michael, cancel tomorrow's golf outing. Because <laughs> Michael, Michael slays him, brother. He kills him. Think about this. Lucifer had one-third of the angels. Michael has one-third of the angels. That means Gabriel has one-third of the angels. Who do you think showed up on that hill in, in, in Luke chapter 2? When it says an angel showed up. Could you imagine what it must have been like if one-third of heaven showed up? And said glory to God in the highest. My goodness. I don't know what your plans were, but you know what you'd say when they left? Guys, we need to go in town and see about this. <laughs> right? And that's what they did. So, so Michael goes in here. And he stops this. Uh, he stands against him. And, uh, and there was war in heaven, verse 7, war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. <clears throat> Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Uh, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called uh, the devil and Satan. I told him this morning, the, the Greek word for devil in that verse is democrato. which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, uh, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a, vo a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now guys, you're going to be here a little bit longer for what I'm going to tell you. This is a sidebar, but you're going to want to hear the sidebar. Okay? The devil hates you but you don't know why. You really don't know why. You say, well, yeah, because I serve God. Some of you ain't serving God. I mean, really, some of you aren't doing anything for God. So why would he hate you for that? Let me tell you why, why he hates you. Um, if you had a job, let's say you had a job at a factory or, or you're, you're you know, a business manager, you're an office guy, you show up for work uh, one day and your supervisor meets you there and says, uh, uh, listen, I, I got bad news, but uh, you're fired. They told me to tell you, you're fired. Could I ask you people something? Why is it when somebody loses their job, we say they got fired? Don't raise your hand. I'll raise mine. I will raise mine. You don't have to raise yours. Have you ever been fired? Okay, if you were ever fired, the day they fired you, did, did your boss pour five gallons of gas on you and light you? Why, why, don't, why doesn't the guy come home and say, honey, I got disemployed today? Because isn't that actually what happened? Why do we say he got fired? Okay, this guy, Lucifer, is showing the manifesting, the light of God. And you know what happened? Keep this thought in mind, these words, and his heart was lifted up. I can think of three places where that happens. Hezekiah was a great king, was he not? And he gets God to, to, to move that that uh, sun back 10, 10 degrees and he got all proud. It says his heart was lifted up and those Babylonians came down. He said, hey guys, man, God did that for me. Said, yeah, just take a look at everything. And he got in trouble. Uh, Uzziah was a great king, but his heart was lifted up. Read it sometime. And he said, my heart's lifted up. I can go in there and do the job of a priest. And he ended up being a leper. Take a look at, um, in fact, this kind of nice uh, go get Isaiah, get Isaiah chapter, uh, get Isaiah chapter 14, uh, keep your place here in, in uh, Revelation, but get Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'll make you eat those words? You remember in, uh, I just referred to it, um, in Numbers chapter 16, the, the Cora, Dave, and Byron, they came up to Moses and they said, you take, you take too much upon you. Remember that? Do you remember what Moses said back to him? You sons of Levi, you take too much upon you. Doesn't one guy get in the ring and he said, I am going to whip you. What's the other guy say? Mm -mm, I'll whip you. Now take a look at this. This is the class. Guys, we now have the most powerful God. He's got class. So watch this. 
Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Uh, for thou hast said in... Let me try to find a piece of paper here. There it is. For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend. All right? Watch, watch what Lucifer says. He says... No less than five times, I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. Well, watch yourself when you say, I will. So watch this, verse 13. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the, the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. All right, what was, don't try to remember them all. What was the last I will? I will be like God, right? His plan is to kill God. How are you going to take the throne? You, you, you got to kill the guy on the throne. His plan, that's why he was a murderer from the beginning. He is going to sit on that throne as God. He said, I will. Be like the Most High, right? Now, guys, do you know how much power your God's got? He's got so much power that whipping the devil isn't a big deal, so he has to do it with class. You know, some of you guys, shame on you. You know what you think? You think this contest between our God and the devil is like this great big arm wrestling contest, and you read something bad happen, you go, oh, look. Oh, look, the devil's winning today. And then something good happens, you go, oh, look, God's winning today. Are you kidding me? You know, I don't know how many heavyweight champions of the world there are right now. I don't know how there can always be about three or four of them. But, um, uh, you know, you got this, you got the heavyweight champ and you got the challenger. And the challenger is going to go try to take the belt. And they usually ask the challenger first, hey, uh, how do you think the fight's going to go? And he says something like this, I'll go, I'll come, I'll, I'll throw it out. <laughs> That's all the father can count. And he said, okay. So then they go to the champ. They say, hey, champ. Uh, he said he's going to knock you out in the third round. What do you think? And he goes, well, see, that's my problem. My problem is it's going to be no contest. I'm going to whip him so easily. So to give this kid a chance, what I'm going to do is 40 days before the fight, I'm just not going to eat anything. That way when I get in the ring, I'll be real weak. Real weak. Whoa. I was telling the guys or somebody the other day, I had a pastor friend of mine. Uh, he called me up. He said, pray for me, brother. I said, what's the matter? He goes, oh, man. He said, I just got done fasting for three weeks trying to find the will of God, and I couldn't get an answer from God. I said, oh, man, thank you for calling me and telling me that. He said, why? I said, because now, if I don't know the will of God for my life, if I'm ever tempted to fast for three weeks, I now know it doesn't work. I will, I will eat. <laughs> I heard Brother Coral say one time, he fasted 40 days. He said, the last 10 days you lay in bed and your body devours itself. How would you like at the end of that 10 days to get in the ring with the, with the, the greatest power of evil in the universe? You know what's wrong with you? You hear about Jesus fasting 40 days and you go, you go, wow, if I fasted 40 days, that'd make me spiritual. That'd make you hungry. In fact, I tell them guys, they keep fasting 40 days. I said, Jesus did it once. That's enough for him. Okay. And so here's what your God did to give the devil a chance, man. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It says afterward he was in hunger. He stepped in the ring and he knocked the devil out through the ropes and three punches. It is written. It is written. It is written. Right? Why? You know what, the, you know what God could do? He could pluck one hair from his head and flog the devil to death with it. That is the power of your God. Now, mark the five I wills, and the last I will is, I will be like the Most High. All right? Now go to Ezekiel chapter 28. You know what God says? So he says, hey, God, you're going to win this? Win it? Uh, of course I'm going to win it. He said, my problem is I just want to make it, you know, give the kid a chance. I'll show you what I'm going to do. I think I'll just make him eat his words. So, 
Watch what happens. In Ezekiel chapter 28, Look about verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 28, <clears throat> verse 16. Oh, let's pick it up, verse 13. No, let's pick it up on verse 12. In fact, let's start at chapter 8. Some of you guys need to read some Bible. Uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 12. I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and send him, Thus saith the Lord God, uh, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You say, how do you know this is the devil and not the king of Tyrus? Keep reading. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. You think that king of Tyrus been in Eden? Who'd been in Eden? All right. Every precious stone. See it? Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So here's what it is, guys. He was like a great big disco ball with all kinds of colors. Instead of just, just white lights bounce around, I mean he was, he was reflecting the light of God in all of those beautiful colors. And it went to his heart. We say, oh man, that went to your head. No, no, it went to his heart. Look what it says. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He's above the throne. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. <clears throat> and I've set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones uh, of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways uh, from the day that thou wast created till iniquity is found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, oh, look what God says. I will cast his profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy the old covering chair from the midst uh, of the stones of fire. Look what it says. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. You're saying, are you saying when good things happen, we got to get ready for something bad to happen? Nope. I had a student years ago, 30 some years ago, walked into class. He goes, pray for me, brother. Pray for me. I said, what's wrong? He goes, nothing. I said, what am I praying for you for? Well, you know, when things are going good, something bad's going to happen. So I slapped him. <laughs> Didn't have to wait for John Calvin. No, it doesn't mean when things are good, something bad's going to happen. It means when God does something good for you, don't let it go to your heart. Well, God did that because I read more Bible than anybody else. God did that because I win more souls. God did that because I, I live holier. Read all the Bible you can. Win all the souls you can. Live as holy as you can. Don't let it go to your heart. Uzziah couldn't get past it. Hezekiah couldn't get past it. And Lucifer couldn't get past it. Thine heart was lifted up <clears throat> because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will, number three, cast thee out, uh, cast thee the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy, tabern, uh, thy, thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. We call that heartburn. <laughs> it shall devour thee and I will, this is God's last I will, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of of all them that behold thee. What was the devil's last I will? I will be like the Most High. You know what God's last I will is? You'll be dust on the ground. And you know what you're doing tonight? Every saved person in here, you are betting your soul on who wins that fight. Right? I mean, come on, as soon as somebody wins, whether it's the champ or the challenger, they don't say the issue's resolved. They say, let's have a what? God threw the, he whipped the devil in Isaiah chapter 14. He whipped him again in Matthew chapter 4. There is going to be one more rematch. It's going to happen in Israel in the, in the battle of Armageddon. And you are betting your soul on who wins. I don't know if you realize this, but do you know Satan worshipers, worshipers believe in the battle of Armageddon? They just think their guy's going to win. That's what they think. 
Well, man, you got a two-time loser. Who's a two-time loser? Hillary? Anyway, anyway. <clears throat> oh, wait a second, wait a second. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. The guy wins the fight. And you know what we say? Three cheers for the winner. Right? Watch the three cheers in, in, in Ezekiel chapter 28. Look at the, uh, just about three lines up from the end. Now, now, when I read this, I'm sorry, guys. You can think anything you want. You think I'm crazy. I don't care what you think. But every time I read these three verses, right after that happens, I see God. You ever see right after the fight, the, 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 the challenger is out flat, and this guy, they got the robe on, he's got the belt, and he goes, I won, right? Here's what I see. Look at verse 22. He says, I am the Lord. Look at the end of verse 23. I am the Lord. Look at the end of verse 24. I am the Lord God. Three cheers for the winner. That's our guy. That's our God. So he is going to win. Go back to Revelation. About done. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. Um, whoops. That's Matthew. Revelation chapter 12. The, uh, the devil is going to get thrown out. Now watch what, what takes place. Oh, oh. I was asking you why, why the devil hates you. Right? It's not because you're serving God. It's not because you belong to God. You go to work. And your, and your boss, your, your supervisor comes and says, I'm sorry, guy, they fired you. So you're walking out to your car. And as you're walking out to your car, here comes this guy. Never saw him around before. But he looks like one of those guys where his suits fit. And his shirts look like they're ironed on him. A little bit of gray around the temples. Just really looking like a classy guy. And, 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 but you ever saw him before? And as he walks by, he looks at the guy with you. And the guy with you says, uh, hello, Mr. Baker. He goes, hello, Bob. And he walks in, past you and, and you go, you go, Who's that? Uh, that's your replacement. Hope you break a leg. Do you know him? Do you like him? Why? He got your job. Now, when this guy lost his job, why do we say you get fired? Why do you not say you get disemployed? Get this. God had a little problem. He's taking this guy out of his job but he has no place to put him. There is no unemployment. So he made a place for the devil and his angels. And when you take and put, you know, enamels or clay into a kiln, you know what you say? We're going to fire it. And so that is why when we lose our jobs, we don't say I got disemployed. We say I got fired. But wait a minute, guys. If somebody gets fired, doesn't somebody have to replace them? Well, keep your place here. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Let's see if we can find his replacement. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Do you know why the devil hates every one of you, whether you're serving God or not? You got his job. That's what happened. You got his job. He hates you because you got his job. Now, I just want to give you that scenario for one more, one more, one little change. You walk in, you get fired, you're walking out, you go, you're walking out to, the, to the car, and it's not this suave-looking guy in a three-piece suit. He's got a little bit of gray around his temples. Here comes this doofy kid, baseball hat on sideways, this much of his underwear sticking above his belt, those baggy pants, he takes two steps before they take one. Da, 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 da. And as he walks by, he goes, uh, he goes, hi, Bobby. Uh, yeah, hi, Tommy. And you go, <laughs> stupid pizza delivery boy forgot his pizza in the car. Uh, it's not, that's, that's not pizza delivery boy. Oh, uh, who's that? <clears throat> that's uh, your, your replacement. I mean, if you heard the first guy, you know, so who, did this, who is that guy in the suit? Oh, well, he just, he just got done teaching at MIT. Uh, he took care of fixing the lens on the Hubble space telescope. He's the guy that showed them how to take care of the problem down at Three Mile Island nuclear plant. I mean, at least you'd say, look what they had to replace me with. What would you do with the doofus? 
Now, I cannot prove to you that what I'm about to tell you happened, but I sure like to think it, so don't mess with me. You know what I've often seen? I see this picture. Stand on this earth. God says to Lucifer, you're fired. And you know what he says? Where are you going to find a replacement like me? There is nobody in this universe like me. Where are you going to find somebody to do my job? It wouldn't be something the Lord just said this. He said, uh, step aside a minute. Okay. And reach down to the dirt he was standing on and goes, hello, Adam. Meet your replacement. How would you like to be replaced by a dirt ball? Does that not add insult to injury? Yeah. Now, wait a second. Let's add one more thing to this. A week later, the kid with the baseball hat on sideways blows up half the plant. He does something wrong, sets it on fire. Wouldn't you want to call the boss and go, well, I see your little genius just cleared a place for a new wing. <laughs> when you lose your job, don't you have to get a new job? Did the devil lose his job? Let's see if he gets a new job. Look at verse 10. And I heard a, vo a loud voice, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, <clears throat> the kingdom of our God, and the power of uh, his uh, Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. He used to be the light bearer. You know what he is now? His new career? He's accuser of the brethren. You know what some of you ought to do? You ought to watch yourself and listen to yourself and see which one of those jobs you're trying to do. Are you trying to reflect the light of God and manifest the light of God to this world? Or are you always being a Baptist? Now, I know you're Baptist, so Baptist never gossip, but Baptist can split a church with a prayer request. Invite somebody over for dinner. Well, you know, we love Pastor Gomez. We really do, you know, but there's just some problems. You being new here, I know you wouldn't understand, and you probably think everything is just fine. And really, we just brought you here because we want you to pray about this. Accuser of the brethren. When you get on the phone and you spread a prayer request, you are accusing the brethren. You ever badmouth anybody, any Christian? Oh, not me. Yeah, everybody disagreed with you. And you accuse the brethren. You know, the only thing that bothers me, I am not fearful or intimidated to think that the devil is accusing me before God right now. You know what bothers me? It is the one time that the father of all lies can tell the truth. He doesn't have to make up something about me and you. All he's got, you know what happened? If that, guy, if that kid blows up the plant, you're going to call the plant manager, the owner, and go, you replaced me with him. Look what he did. You know what the devil says to, to the Lord? You, you replace me with Gip? You see him? He looks at some of you and says, you hear that joke? You see what they're drinking right now? You see what he's watching right now? And, and you replace me? Yeah, that's reflecting your light? Guys, the thing that bothers me about the devil accusing me before God is he, he can tell the truth. And the truth is bad enough. Verse 11, be about done. <clears throat> and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So guys, oh, and look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Uh, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that, his, that he hath but a short time. How much time? Three and a half years. And he is really going to unload on those Jews. That's what he's going to do. So guys, is there a mid-tribulation rapture? Yes. It happens three and a half years after ours. All right? We leave before the whole thing starts. The 144,000, Moses and Elijah go to Jerusalem. They begin to, to uh, prophesy for three and a half years. And anybody messes with them, they bring in the plagues. The 144,000 go around the world trying to get somebody to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Everybody that does, three and a half years later, goes up, according to Revelation chapter 14. The devil loses his battle in heaven. He comes down. He is angry because his time is short. And he really unloads on the Jews. And it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. You will not be here for that. 
I always tell people, I said, we're just going to kind of watch that like a science fiction flick. After dinner entertainment. We're going to watch it, but we're not going through it. And if you don't understand your Bible, then you end up in Phoenix. Okay, preacher. Let's stand, please. Maybe you're here without Christ. You've never been saved. Maybe you'd like to come tonight. Maybe something was said that made you think a little bit. Maybe you've been on the wrong side of the issue. You ought to come tonight. Whatever your need is, you know, the Lord has spoke to your heart about, you make sure that you do. It's not the first time when Rosenthal did this stuff and these guys start teaching this stuff and it's, they act like it's something new, but it's not something new at all. It's been around a long time. A lot of those old men have fought those battles. Dr. Howes told me a long time ago, every generation got to fight his own battles. We have. Some of you young boys trying to do it now, but you're being influenced by the Internet instead of by studying your Bible and at least questioning somebody in the flesh instead of you just following some guru. You ought to make sure that you ponder these things and know these things. We place off if you need to visit the altar to make sure that you do tonight.